Hi everyone, it's Mr. H here and welcome to this video on electric potential difference. I want to begin this video with looking at a demo from the University of Colorado. Um, it's called FET is the website is known as. I'll put the link to this below the video um, and you can click on this and check it out for yourselves. So let's have a look at what it's like to build a circuit using their program. This is really simple when you open it up just on the side there's little things you can pull in there's wires, there's batteries, there's light bulbs, there's resistors, and there's switches. For the uh, purpose of this video, I'm not going to use a resistor. I'm going to use a light bulb. And keep in mind that a light bulb is a resistor. Um, what happens in a light bulb, if we're looking at a very simple light bulb, uh, an incandescent one, is there's a very small filament in the light bulb. It's a very thin piece of wire. And that wire is very difficult for electrons to travel through. And so that creates the resistance. So what I've done with all these things is I have put them together and then if I close this switch the current begins to run. And you can see there that um, the battery, across the battery, there's a voltage of 9 volts. And you can see that as that current is running there it's measuring that current at 0 0.90 amps. And so we've got a voltmeter measuring the voltage, we've got an ammeter measuring the current, um, and that's obviously the light is turned on and, and bright and you can see that that the electrons are traveling around this circuit. Now that is what direct current is. When we make a circuit, a uh, basic circuit, we close it off, it needs to have a full loop, it needs to have a resistor in it, it needs to have a power source in it, and then it needs to be connected by wires. It doesn't need a switch, the switch can just be opening or closing a wire, or connecting or disconnecting a wire. Um, and so we always measure the voltage um, across the battery or across the bulb. I could do that as well if I bring another uh, voltmeter in here. If I move the voltmeter, for example, I could measure the voltage across the bulb. I could say, what's the voltage from here until here? And we would see that the voltage is 9 volts across the, the bulb. So in other words, we're gaining 9 volts across the battery, and then we're, we're losing those 9 volts across the bulb. And so the reason I'm talking about volts is because our lesson for today is voltage. That's another way of saying electric potential difference. Let's have a look at a few notes and then we'll come back and do some comparisons with this circuit and another one. The symbol for electric potential difference is V. And just to confuse us, uh, the SI unit is the same. It's also V for volts. Now this is named after Alessandro Volta. Uh, he was an Italian physicist in the 18th century and in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and he made huge breakthroughs for us in the area of electricity. Uh, electric potential energy is energy required to cause electrons to push electrons through all the loads resistors in a circuit. So there are going to be some electrons that have more energy from the battery um, before they've gone through the resistor and they're going to push the ones that have gone through the resistor to force them to get back to the battery to get more energy. Electric potential difference is the change in the electric potential energy for each coulomb of charge across a load or a resistor and across a battery. It may make a little bit of sense if you look at this equation right down here. The electric potential difference, V, is equal to the change in energy divided by the charge in coulombs. The energy measured in joules charge in coulombs. That's a Q. So that is what electric potential difference is. And so what you saw a minute ago is you saw all these electrons moving around a circuit, hence they had to have energy. And so it's the amount of energy they have per charge. The voltmeter is often symbolized by a V with a circle around it. And in the thing we looked at a few minutes ago, uh, we saw that it was it looked more realistic, like an actual voltmeter. But if we're drawing it in just a simple drawing, we would just put it like that. And keep in mind that we're going to often refer to electric potential difference and voltage, and we're going to use those two terms interchangeably. So those mean the same thing. So keep that in mind as we go through this. The electric potential difference is determined by measuring the work done in moving the charge between the two points. And we know that work is the change in energy. So we can write that as the change in energy divided by the charge. Now the units, I already alluded to these, but the units are going to be one joule per coulomb uh, because energy is in joules and charge Q is in coulombs. And that's one volt. So let's look at two examples and see how this works uh, as we 
just do some of the math and then we'll go back to the circuits and have a look at what this actually means. So the first example says what's the potential difference across an air conditioner if 72 coulombs of charge transfers 8.5 times 10 to the 3 joules of energy to the fan and to the compressor. So the first thing we want to do is write down our givens. This is relatively straightforward because we're just going to sub numbers into the equation that we have up above. We have a charge of 72 coulombs. We have a change in energy of 8.5 times 10 to the 3 joules because it's um, transferring that much energy to the, ener to the fan and the compressor. And we're trying to figure out the voltage or the electric potential difference um, as it does so. So here we go. We go ahead and we take that equation of the change in energy per charge and we sub those numbers in. So we're going to go 8.5 times 10 to the 3 joules and we're going to divide that by 72 coulombs. And that gives us an answer of 2 sig digs, so 1.2 times 10 to the 2 volts, or 118 is what you likely get on your calculator, but then you move it to uh, proper sig digs. So we would conclude, therefore, the potential difference across the air conditioner, potential difference across the air conditioner, is 1.2 times 10 to the 2 volts. There you go. And for the next question, it's important to note a couple of things that we've seen before. So I'm just going to show where these came from as we get to the next question. So this next question says, how much electrical energy is required if someone leaves the TV on for eight hours a day for a year? So this is someone who just needs the we're locked down, you have no one else at home, you leave your TV on just to get some accompaniment. Uh, the TV has a current rating of 0.5 amps and requires 120 volts. Now you might look at this and say, well, what do we know in this case? Well, we know that time is for a year. So we've got time. What does that have to do with it? It's eight hours. And that's going to be times 365 days. So that's going to give me a total number of hours of 2,920 hours. I'm going to leave some space there because we might be doing more with the time here in a minute. We know the current is 0 0.50 amps. And we also know that the voltage is 120 volts. So we have two significant digits, it looks like, in these values. So this is all we're given. We're given nothing else except this. And so here's where this little bullet point will come in handy. Remember that uh, because the voltage is equal to the energy per charge, and because the current is the charge divided by the time, or the amount of charge that passes a point per second, uh, we can derive uh, a different expression for the energy. We can take this, rearranging it for Q, and then in place of Q, we get the current times the change in time. So I'm going to place that into the Q. So a lot of these equations are relatively straightforward in this unit, but one of the things we're going to have to do occasionally is we're going to have to manipulate them and sub them together, and that's what I've done here. In place of the Q, I've replaced it with I delta T. And so we now know that we can find our change in energy because we know V, we know I, we know delta T, um, and that's what we're asked to find. We're asked to find the electrical energy. So as I've said, we can say, because of what we have up above, since delta E is V times Q, and since Q is I times delta T, that means that the change in energy is V times I times delta T. Now, there's one other thing I want to point out here, because some of us, oops, some of us might, um, might just go ahead and sub things in. We need in SI units. Is this in SI units? No. To get that in SI units, we have to put that in seconds. So 2920 hours. And then if you recall, we have, um, if we want hours to cancel, we're going to put one hour and we're going to put 3600 seconds in the numerator. And so this gives us a value of uh, 10,512,000 seconds. 
So that's what we need to have it in in order to solve this SI units. So V is 120 volts. Our current is 0.5 amps. Our time is uh, a very large number, 10,512,000 seconds. If it helps put the commas there, there you go. And that gives us an answer of 63072 followed by four zeros. So we get 630,720,000 joules. We need to put that to two significant digits, so we would say that 6.3 times 10 to the power of 8 joules. It's a lot of joules. Now, we have solved questions about the amount of electrical energy before, and we know that the other way we can do that not only in joules, is in kilowatt hours. And if you recall, one kilowatt hour is equal to 3.6 million joules. So we could also express it like that. You can't set it up at the beginning to solve like that in this particular case because we're dealing with volts and amps. Um, it's not the same as we did earlier, but you can change it at the end. So if I take this and I multiply that by... Um, we know that there's going to be one kilowatt hour and six, uh, three, six, zero, zero, that many joules. Then what I'm going to get is uh, 175 or 1.8 uh, times 10 to the two kilowatt hours. So that would be another way to express that particular amount of joules uh, and that particular amount of energy rather. And so we would then conclude, therefore, um, the amount of energy used used is 6.3 times 10 to the 8 joules, or 1.8 times 10 to the 2 kilowatt hours. Now, if you were charged, for example, um, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, that's going to be somewhere around 35 bucks. For the year so it's not too bad uh, your TV isn't using that much power overall unless you have like a full wall TV or something so pretty reasonable as far as costs are concerned so there you go there's some examples one more straightforward one more involved that use that let's go back and have a look now at the circuits so what you can see here is I have the initial circuit from earlier in this lesson um, running there the switch is closed and it's running and then what I've done is I've created an almost identical circuit here on the right side. In this case, though, it, it still has the battery, it still has the switch, but it has not one bulb, but two bulbs. And what I want you to notice as I close this switch is I want you to compare how fast these electrons begin to move in the left compared to the right. Maybe make a prediction now and see if your prediction's right when you do that. So pause the video, make a prediction, and then uh, unpause the video, play it again, and see if your prediction is correct and we'll discuss why all right so hopefully you've made a prediction so here we go i've closed that circuit and so you'll notice that on the circuit on the right those electrons are moving much slower than the circuit on the left and so the assumption with this equation that because voltage is the energy divided by the charge is that we just think about voltage in terms of energy and it's not a bad analogy but it's not just the energy in terms of the speed of the electrons. It's more to do than the speed. So these have the exact same voltage yet uh, across the bulb, yet they're moving a lot slower on the right because there's more resistance. And what comes into play here is something called Ohm's law that we'll look at in the coming lesson. Basically, the thing to note is that the more resistance you have, the slower the electrons are going to travel, but that does not mean that you have a lower voltage. You'll, you can see that what's happened though is the current is now 0.45 amps. Because we've uh, doubled the resistance, we get less brightness out of each of the bulbs and the current becomes half of what it was. So we've actually effectively slowed down those electrons because the current is measuring how many electrons pass a point in a given amount of time. If we double the resistance but keep the voltage the same, we half the current. And that's what we're going to see in tomorrow's lesson with Ohm's Law. So feel free to download this or click on this and try it out yourself. Uh, I'm just running this out of my, um, I didn't have to download it, I'm just running it out of my browser. So you, you're welcome to do that. Uh, play around, build some circuits, see how they work. 
The last thing I want to point out quickly is this. Here's this resistor. Um, I'm going to just turn it into, uh, get it away from this uh, real looking bulb and real looking battery to what you would draw if you were drawing it. Um, notice that you would draw a battery looking something like this. The longer side is the positive side and the shorter side is the negative side. Now you'll see that what we're representing here is the electrons. They're the minus charges, the negative charges, traveling uh, in this direction around the circuit. You'll notice that we have these little circles with the little curve in them that represents a bulb. Um, you can see in your textbook how that's drawn as well. We might draw that a little bit different, but if you draw it like that, that's fine as well. The key here, though, is the difference between um, conventional current and electron flow. And this was part of yesterday's lesson, but I do want to point it out now that we have this visual in front of us. Electrons want to be repelled from the negative side of a battery, and they want to come and be attracted to the positive side of the battery. And that's what we're seeing in this diagram. But all of our homework questions and all of our diagrams that we see in our lessons uh, are using what's called conventional current. Because what we originally thought before we knew that the electrons were doing it is that it was moving from the positive to the negative. So if we click on conventional current, you'll see this that the current direction is actually switched around. So we're always going to be talking about conventional current, and it's always going to be moving in this direction. Now, some students might ask me, well, Mr. Hamilton, why do we have conventional current? Why don't we just use electron flow current if we know that's now correct? Well, I'll ask you the same question about building code in Ontario. Why do we use feet and inches when everything in Canada is in centimeters and meters? It's because that has been taken as the conventional way of doing things, and it hasn't been changed. So maybe you can be part of the catalyst for change, to change every textbook everywhere, <laughs> to become electron flow. Seems like a lot of work when it's just remembering it's the opposite direction. But nonetheless, it is backwards uh, to what's really happening. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out, ask for help. And as I said, play around with this yourself. Try to build some circuits. Have fun.